Good afternoon and welcome to this latest in the elephant series uh, on the COVID-19 pandemic and its political, social and economic impact. And this afternoon, I am uh, really honored and it's a great pleasure uh, to be joined by Ali Kansachu, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Rich Management. Uh, he is a geopolitical and economic analyst of events across sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Karibu Ali Khan. Thank you, John. And uh, by Julian Roa, a banker uh, who rose from being a teller to a senior manager in, in banking, what throughout the region, uh, a Pan-Africanist, and, uh, and also now, now also a consultant uh, currently completing uh, his PhD in conversational intellectualism. Welcome, Julia. Thank you very much, John. Uh, gentlemen, uh, before we launch into so many other things, I just wanted to ask how, how, how you are doing. Uh, you know, how is lockdown, how is coronavirus treating you, your businesses, and the work that you do? Um, th thank you, John, for today's invitation. I think, um, you know, I kind of saw this uh, coming at us in early January, um, uh, a little bit late in the day, because it's now obvious that uh, this began sometime in September or October in the Wuhan area of China. But I've always been interested in, in viruses and in pandemics. I'd studied the Spanish flu. I looked, read through a uh, few CDDs, the, uh, the history of the Peloponnesian War. And it's fascinating, John, how interesting and how circular our reaction as a society is. The denial phase, the exponential phase and all, all of that. But I've been sitting here fortunately, uh, in Kiambu, the old coffee country of Nairobi, and uh, actually enjoying this time of quarantine and reflection. Um, because, you know, we live in a 21st century, we're plugged into the world at the same time. It's paradoxical that you're kind of outside it. But uh, business-wise, it's been very interesting. It's been a time of transition. Um, but I felt that it, it was a, a, as much a circuit break in my life as it has been for the world. Okay. Julian, how, how, how is lockdown treating you? It's interesting, John. Um, I'm just in the process of finishing my studies, and I was trying to figure out uh, where I should jump into. I, I know I've started a concept on, on my business, which I've taken through some trials. Yeah. Uh, and then comes COVID, and I'm thinking this is going to be a big destabilizer. I had everything properly, you know, you know, imagined, uh, you know, developed, thought through, and mine was just to go ahead and do some bit of implementation. And when COVID happened, a lot of the contracts that I had, I think two to be specific, were actually suspended. And I was left thinking, what do I do next? Like such, a, I went into a state of self-reflection. And then I realized it's not all doom and gloom that uh, COVID could actually come with its own advantages. Uh, I made the decision that I will not let it go to waste. So there are three things that I've decided to focus on. And one of those was to learn from it. What is COVID teaching us, especially from a business perspective and a personal growth perspective? Uh, second, I asked myself, what could I possibly build? And I thought, what a better time than to build my consultancy firm now? coming with new interventions to business problems. And then third, I asked myself, this is something I could possibly secure, something I really wanted to invest in. It was probably so difficult or more expensive to invest three months ago. Could I do it now? And the answer is yes. So I've gone through a very interesting phase and the next three months will be very telling on what changes about my life. Excellent. So we'll come back to you in 90 days time and see how it all went. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <yeah. laughs> um, um, what, 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 you know, we we spent the first sort of three months of of of, of this pandemic, really going back to around March, um, focused very heavily on the epidemiology, on, on 
on the virus, on the numbers, how many people were infected, how many were recovering. And it's only now that the focus has shifted, you know, quite squarely on, on the impact, uh, on the economic impact, on the, on the political changes and, uh, and, the, and the social disruption that is underway. And I wanted to get, you know, what, what, what are your perspectives? You, you know, you've, you've all uh, been um, uh, in... In, in, in the private sector, in business, uh, most of your most of your professional lives, and I wanted to get your take of on on uh, what the impact is um, for us here in Kenya, and 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 also globally, um, what changes have been wrought by by the COVID nineteen coronavirus pandemic, and that's just an open question. Um, uh, John, so my, my first impression, if I can take it from Africa, was that we felt the bow wave of the COVID effect economically before we felt it medically. Mm. So because of uh, a, a lack of as much hyper-connectedness between China and ourselves, um, we kind of experienced an economic uh, uh, shock, shock before we experienced the medical emergency. So what was interesting to me was that, you know, there, were, there was a lot of comment talking about how we were dodging the medical uh, problem. We were, there was something in our genes or in the environment. I don't, there, were, there were a lot of comments like that. And, um, and clearly that all is debunked now. So we've got a, it's starting from a low base, we've got the medical emergency now building up steam, and clearly it's going to grow very, very fast from here in most cases. But economically, it has definitely been a tremendous circuit breaker. And going into it, Africa had overborrowed made, I would argue, very suboptimal investments, and you had COVID land on top of it all. So I think looking at Africa, the challenge is very little fiscal room um, to deal with what is a once in a century pathogen. Um, and I still think um, a lack of uh, what I would call um, realism amongst our policymakers. I mean, I follow many of our policymakers on social media, and yes. it's unbelievable, really, the intellect, the lack of introspection, the failure to look at past policies which have failed, and to realize the emergency of the situation that we're currently facing. Just to take it globally, I think what struck me globally was um, uh, fascinating, the correlation between hocus-pocus populism yes. and populists who won elections by essentially dumbing down the argument, and whether it was Brexit, and, and I no offense to what happened in Britain, whether it was Trump, whether it was Narendra Modi, um, this ethnocratic nationalism, this uh, sort of flattening of cognitive ca capacities amongst your citizens. And to me, COVID was a perfect storm. These guys could not deal with the situation and they still have not dealt with the situation. If you look at the top five, top six countries, it's Bolsonaro's Brazil, it's Trump's America, it's Narendra Modi's India. Um, it's all the countries where leadership, um, I feel, has really let its citizens down. Um, Julian, um, uh, you know, if, if 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 I can ask you to to, to speak to the to the same issue, um, but perhaps put in something which comes out of of, of something that um, Ali Khan has just said. Um, that it seems we are also experiencing. Uh, a, almost a failure of imagination, uh, uh, you know, amongst our own leaders and, uh, uh, you know, caused, you know, basically being um, accelerated exponentially by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, but I'll be very keen for your, for your, for your perspective. John, as if Corona happening wasn't bad enough, 
the interventions governments and especially in Africa put in place are, are even a lot more appalling in my view. So you're dealing with a health situation that requires critical thinking, analysis and proper interventions. But at the same time, you end up with decisions that have very direct and serious impacts on us as people, both socially and economically, which clearly begs the question, are we properly thinking through some of the solutions that we're asking about? So if I was to take the Kenyan example, for instance, you talk about curfew, mm. it has social and economic implications. Social distancing, it has implications as well as social. Lockdown, lockdown will affect both micro and microeconomics, yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. Restrictions of gatherings, traveling limitations, quarantine. So in one hand, you want to believe that these interventions mean well. Yeah. But again, you have to ask yourself if you're looking at both sides of the equation, um, and if you look at how systems operate, is it causing another problem? And the answer is yes. So now I'm persuaded to go back to a very basic principle in, 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 in business, which I learned a few years ago by the name triple bottom line. And triple bottom line looks at decisions and the impact they have on three aspects of life. And that will be the economics, that will be the social side of it, and the environmental. So if you're to look at health, the health issue being tackled under corona as being social, then you're seeing decisions very much skewed to dealing with the health issues. We still have to go back and ask, were they effective? But as if that is not good enough, then we also now are beginning to see very serious implications of those decisions to our economic well-being and to the continued sustainability of our economy and our businesses. Yeah. So I'm persuaded to ask the question, look at Tanzania, and I'm just using this as case studies, look at Tanzania and the direction that they took and look at Kenya and the direction that we took. The question that comes then is, why did Tanzania take the direction that they did take? And I know for some times we ridiculed their approach and we made a big joke of what Magofuli is doing, but I'm persuaded that he also has advices. What are they seeing that we are not seeing? I think when finally everything settles and we take a scorecard in, in the next six months, it will be very interesting to see who are the winners and the losers. So you're right, John, to say, we see total lack of imagination. Even just within the management of the medical aspect of things, it has left a lot to be desired. To date, I do not know what the objectives are, what the strategic choices were made, what strategic choices were made and why, and what the success for those interventions will look like. We have no idea how that looks like. So you are right to say we are lacking on imagination and that is going to cost us dearly as a country and as a people in Africa. If, 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 if I mean, and I think this is what um, our anxiety um, has been consumed by the virus. Um, but now, you know, I was looking at a, a, a survey done uh, by, by TIFA, uh, TIFA Research and um, which, which came out earlier this month that, that, that you, you, you may have seen reported in the, in the mainstream media. And, um, and they were looking at statistics for unemployment. And we're talking about you know, over 60% unemployment. I mean, of, of, of the sample that they did, the national representative sample. Um, but what, what, what struck me, uh, not only were the unemployment uh, you know, statistics high, but half of those people who have uh, become unemployed, have become unemployed since um, the implementation of measures to mitigate um, the coronavirus pandemic. And I wanted you good gentlemen um, who've been in the private sector uh, much longer than, than, than I have, um, to perhaps you know, look into your crystal balls uh, and uh, what's it gonna look like um, for us economically um, over the coming 12 months? I mean, what, what does the next 12 months look like? I know Ali Khan, you mentioned the debt, uh, you know, the fact that we don't have any fiscal wriggle room. Uh, Julian, you've just, you know, you've just uh, explained this sort of um, failure of, of imagination and its consequences. But economically, you know, what, what, what should can 
Kenyans expect over the next 12 months when people are talking of an event on the scale of the, of, of, of the, the Great Depression of the 1930s? So if I, if I can respond, um, first of all, I think, you know, what has struck me is policy making. Part of the job is to diagnose the problem, right? And when I listen to the diagnosis that I'm hearing, I don't feel that our top policy makers are diagnosing what I am seeing and what I'm thinking. You know, there seems to be an enormous disconnect. When I saw that budget, I thought this is a budget that you could have written last year. And it's as if there was no comment at all. There was, it's as if the economy was just the same, cheap money was going to be available. So let me now look a little bit forward and just let's start with key components of our economy. I come from the coast. So I, I, tourism is something that I have known since I was a young kid. Now, when do we expect tourism to return to normal? Yeah. It is impossible for it to return to normal this year. Even if tomorrow everybody says our airport is open, our source markets are not going to get on the plane. It's a question of behavioral economics. They're going to be nervous. And if we're not on top of COVID, they're going to be be doubly nervous because they're going to think to themselves, I'm not going somewhere where I'm putting myself and my family at risk. At the moment, our strategy around COVID is a little bit like Trump. It's don't test too much, put out a few numbers which look like, you know, uh, uh, optically 150 to 250. I mean, we're flying blind with a blindfold on. Whether this is a, a, a mega foolish strategy, another way to <laughs> just say to ourselves, it's coming. Let's just let's just uh, um, uh, look as if we're doing something about it. But at the end of the day, it's going to run through our economy. There's nothing we can do about it. I don't know. But, so tourism down big time. Remittances. Just have a look around, John. This was the biggest foreign exchange earner for Kenya. Middle East today. Uh, you know, it, all the stories I'm hearing are horrendous. The speed with which they're sending people back. You look, at, you look at the domestic economy, where's the demand going to come from? If 60% of people don't have a job, what are they going to be, where are they going to be finding the money? So I call it like a, a complete economic circuit breaker. And to date, I don't see us having reacted. I know it's difficult to react because it's a supply and a demand shock. Yes. And it's, at the same time, I, I haven't seen a, a, a sense that our people understand it and our people are putting something in play that's going to work in the medium term. So I'm very worried, let me be frank, and I don't think we've got the room. I don't think our interventions are going to give us, our interventions to me are like our infrastructure investments, negative return on investment, right? If you look at our biggest investment today, the railway, it's negative. Now the question is, how are we going to deal with all these things? And I'm just not sure, to be honest. But I, what I will say is this is a Great Depression type situation, and we've got to deal with it in a similar manner. Yeah, yeah I, I want to agree with such a, John. Uh, you've given a very scary statistic there. 60% uh, of Kenyans are jobless, 50% has arisen from Corona. Now, that, was, that has serious implications, if you were to ask me. Uh, what do I see the short and midterm looking like? I don't, s the, the damage done is way too deep and way too severe. And it will take quite a bit of time for things to normalize. And we are still talking about a new normal. We still don't even know how that will look like. So I'm seeing in my own projection, it will take us about 12 to 30, 36 months as a country to get back to our feet. 12 to 36 months, 12 if you're lucky, uh, 36 if we work very hard um, to come back to normalcy. But then we will still have to count our losses because I don't see a situation where 100% of the job losses will come back because I think a lot of these job jobs will take new forms and new shapes. Uh, people will lose their jobs, others will come into being. But if I was to put it on a scale, I still think we'll be on a negative. 
I see new business concepts being developed or emerging coming from the lessons learned from COVID. Mm -hmm. and, and those models will have a positive effect and it will also have a negative effect. The negative effect is to simply mean the way we used to do things here, if your sat if your skill sat in a, within a space where COVID made it no longer, you know, tenable, irrelevant, that means you're jobless for a long time until you can again upskill. But we also see other jobs, especially those that will be enabled by the technological platform, you know, emerging and probably becoming even a lot more richer. So there's a bit of optimism for me when, when I think about that. But back to what Sachwe said, demand for non-essential products and services will drop. What does that mean for those businesses that have been offering those products and services? That is something that should worry the establishment. We talk about job losses, we talk about pay cuts, which essentially leads to reduced purchasing power. What does that mean to entrepreneurs or business owners in this country? Mm. Cash crunch. Cash has become so key today. Anybody who has cash at this period in time is very lucky to do have cash because then you can maneuver and do certain things with it. But without cash, how do we expect business resumption? because they've all taken a hit. How do we expect business continuity? It has taken a hit. So some thinking needs to go through this. Think about the non-performing loans. Yes. Even if you restructure it, what magic will you put in place to make sure that we can meet our obligations as business people out there? These are some of the mistakes the policymakers in government, the technocrats in government have thrown us into. And I, I have no idea how we, I have no idea how we'll get out of this. When you look at tourism, which such we've spoken about, the aviation and hospitality industries. Uh, I mean, by the time it resumes operations, how many years will that be? Manufacturing, the intermediate goods movement, the goods that we need so that manufacturing can happen, that again has been thoroughly impacted. Think about construction. Can projects continue the way that they were planned for? Will they be done within scope? Will they be done within budget? Will they be done within time? Any of those variables changing means that that particular project will become way much more expensive. So John, I agree there are positives, but overall, if you look at the net effect, it's going to be very painful for most of us and it will take a lot of years for us to recover. That's my take. Can I just add a couple of points, John? to yeah. what Julian was saying. But I agree with Julian, cash is king, <laughs> if you can get it. Yes. And also, um, those who had access to credit <laughs> um, at some point could become very wealthy because yeah. what we see is uh, a, a, an implosion in prices, of, of asset prices and in businesses. Um, that's, a, that's a given. Uh, real estate is a good example where we had a very bullish real estate market which was not designed for COVID, it was designed for a bull, bull market. <laughs> Precisely. Now you've got <laughs> COVID. I'll take you back to a very famous economist called Schumpeter, the Austrian economist who spoke of creative destruction, which I think Julian was touching on when he was talking about this new digital age that we are going, this, this move to digital. So of course, there are enormous opportunities that always come out of uh, moments of maximum disruption. Um, you can see, for example, in the media, um, you know, you probably get more people watching you today than, 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 a, than a national TV station. So you've had this enormous disruption. Uh, and I think that, that it does present a lot of opportunities. And just to uh, close on the whole thing about the NPLs, you know, we've seen some pretty eye-popping numbers already. Yes. Uh, Barclays, uh, restructuring the loan book, KCB. I mean, we're talking about a billion dollars at KCB. Um, now, <clears throat> all these numbers are assuming that we get a V-shaped recovery, right? So you yep. reach to the guy, you give him three months, and what happens three months later if we're still in the same thing? We have so, no idea. Exactly. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're in this like little spot I've been noticing where 
somehow people think, okay, that, you know, it's going to get a little bit better. What happens if we're at the beginning and we're talking about something that's going to get more intense and more difficult to deal with? What's going to happen then? So that's just to reiterate what, what Julian was saying. Um, uh, let, let, let me throw a question at you. Um, you know, clearly, um, our policymakers and and uh, the policies that they've implemented around um, COVID nineteen, um, especially on, on the economic front, uh, are not fit for purpose given the, the sheer scale of the of the disruption. It's what I'm hearing from both because you're both very bearish uh, about um, the the, uh, the short to medium term. Um, you know, can I can I uh, challenge you with a question of what should they have done differently? Um, what should uh, our cabinet secretary at the Treasury uh, read in his budget um, that he didn't? Um, I mean, you know, the, you know, there's been discussion of, you know, there's certain projects that perhaps we should have stopped out together uh, and move resources um, to, to other areas. But um, what aren't we doing? We, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming clearer what we're doing wrong and on the mistakes that we've made from a policy perspective uh, around uh, the economy. Um, what should we be doing? Uh, given that even in, in you know, in, in, the, in the world's most economically developed countries, they're struggling with this as well. So I agree with that, those questions, and I agree with the fact that, you know, they're all struggling with the same problems. So if you look around the world today, everyone's borrowed far too much money going into this crisis. Um, uh, uh, you know, that this was a symptom of a global disease, not just an African one. Um, uh, here too, we've overborrowed, and really, COVID is giving us an opportunity to look at what we borrowed that money for. And unfortunately, you know, we've overspent on assets which are not going to produce a return for the foreseeable future, as far as I can see. And given the uh, COVID events, it's probably going to mean that a lot of our, whatever scenario analyses we did do, are now completely uh, out, out the window because we've probably projected growth at five, six percent for the next five, six years, expansion of, 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 of demand for the infrastructure, which clearly is not going to come through. The first thing I think the government has got to do personally is to reduce the cost of government. Yeah. And this is an opportunity for them to, to do that. Now, how they go about doing that is not my answer, but if you look at the recurrent expenditure component of our budget, it is just way too high for a country like ourselves. And we've got to look at that and have a serious conversation about it. And we've got to look at the expenditure that's associated with it, and we've got to try and do something about it. With respect to what would I have advised the government to have done, I would have said to the government at the time, I would have gone for a more aggressive lockdown, mass testing of everybody, so we could have found out. And there are lots of clever ways you can do that. Today, we know sewage can give you a very big indicator as to hotspots. So you don't have to be testing everybody. You can be going and testing the sewage and then putting in your team to lock down a particular area where you thought there was a, a, an outbreak. And also to, instead of throwing money away, to have created some kind of minimum digitally dispersed stipend. As you lock places down, you give people a very uh, enough to survive. Yeah. Whether that and that amount could be anything, I don't know. It could be two hundred and fifty bob for all I know. But at least people the ability to feed their families. Because when I also look globally, John, you know, I, I I'm looking at I look, I saw an index coming out of the Peace Institute somewhere, and the the world is on fire. Yes. And it's not taking, it's not going to take much for people just to get very, very angry. And you're going to have a revolution everywhere, right? So it's also, I think, a society issue about, you know, and this could get much worse in my view. So I would have done that, I would have taken a more aggressive testing path. I would have looked to disperse a minimum. We've even got the wherewithal to do that with Safaricom. 
Um, we've been doing that in the northern frontier part of Kenya, I know, putting out payments. And, and that's the approach I would have got to because I seriously think fundamentally, whether it's us as individuals, if this thing now gets out of control and we don't feel good, it's behavioral economics. Yes. People aren't going to go out, right? I mean, if you look at the charts, even before the government said, don't go out, people were not going out because they were getting scared. And you saw that in that Google mobility stuff. So that's what I, I and I think they've got, to, they've got to go and negotiate on their debt and fast. Yeah. And, you know, I know they don't want to because it's going to mean that in the future they won't be able to borrow so easily because everybody will, will put a haircut on, on Kenya's credit rating. But at the end of the day, you know, the, you can't keep kicking this can down the road. You know, the, the, the day comes when you run out of road and that day is coming closer. <laughs> <laughs> Sachi, that's interesting. Yeah, we are coming to the end of that road, John. Uh, yeah, we are coming to the end of it. What could we do differently? I don't know whether it's how government works, John, yes. and you've had the privilege to serve in government. I don't know whether it's the mindset of technocrats. I tend to think we complicate everything, even things that are supposed to be very simple in terms of planning and execution. Why do I say that? To manage COVID more effectively, all we needed to do is to have accountability mm. in the part of the ministries that are directly impacted. We needed to have a joint ministerial committee that clearly spells out what the strategies are and how those strategies will be executed. A few times, if we are to use the Kenyan example specifically, you could see CSS speaking at cross purpose. One makes a decision today, another one comes on television the following day saying, no, this will not happen as was said yesterday. Uh, transport and travel must still be enabled because essentials have to come in. I mean, that just tells you how disjointed the entire operation is, as an example. So accountability is key. You are locking down. Have you done a risk assessment to fully understand the implications of locking down? It's a very basic management principle, which will tell you these are the risks that you stand to face. This could be the magnitude of those risks, the likelihood and the impact, so that it informs the kind of decisions that you make. I have to ask, do these basic disciplines get considered? Analysis of data. Do we have data to work with? So I see the Minister for Health standing up every day and giving us numbers, but I don't know what those numbers mean. So the, the question becomes, what kind of data are we pulling out and for what purposes are we pulling out that data? What sense are we making of those, that data? And then can we weight the data so that we know its significance to aid in decision making? These are very basic things in my mind that any manager should be very clear about. Now, finally, I would also add, what was your strategic philosophy? What, what do you want to achieve at the end of all this? So that we know what successes we will be celebrating when it's all done. I am not clear. I don't know what the government is shooting towards. This would have helped us know how to balance the equation. For instance, the guy in charge of treasury should have still been placed responsible for ensuring that there's continuity in one way or the other. The people within the region, the Aden Mohammed of this world, we should have insisted to see continuity of business across borders. What did we see instead? I'm calling that lack of accountability. And these are the things such as spelled out very clearly. They'll come back to bite us. And when they do, it will be very, very painful. So, what could have been done differently are very basic and simple management principles. We complicate things too much, John. Mm. Yeah, that's my view. Well, if, 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 if I can ask, you know, time flies. Uh, um, and <laughs> uh, especially when you're having fun and talking to you two gentlemen is, is, is very illuminating. Um, let, let me ask a big picture question to... Yeah. to, to to both of you, because you know, uh, we've seen an increasing um, um, introspection uh, 
amongst intellectuals, business, every, you know, maybe it's because of lockdown, you know, so we're all reading more, thinking more, reflecting on life more, we're smelling the roses a bit more. Um, and, and so, you know, it's to ask the both of you is what, what does capitalism look like after this? This is a tremendous disruption. Uh, you know, at the hard physical level, the supply chains disrupted, demand has sort of been sucked out of entire sectors, as I said, the hospitality will probably never recover to its former glory ever. It's changed forever. Um, um, but, you know, we've had this um, um, sort of uh, combination of, of, uh, of, you know, neoliberal capitalism, uh, and, and a sort of hyper globalization that that you know where actually until COVID, uh, the underlying unspoken assumption was that except where you have wars and other sort of you know political disruptions, earthquakes and, and other uh, such um, um, natural phenomena, and of course you know climate change, that growth would go on forever. Um, that, you know, markets will, you know, they'll have dips and they'll self-correct, but mar markets will always be uh, um, uh, bullish. Um, that if, you know, if you invest in property, uh, you know, it will always appreciate in value. Um, COVID has actually caused us to question the very fundamentals uh, of, of, of this system. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to get your reflections on that. Um, Sachi, so allow me to go first. You go first. So that you wrap it up with your mm -hmm. big picture view, which, which, I, which I really like. Mm -hmm. And John, if I was to look at capitalism as an operation funded by profit for profit and is privately owned, for me, the paradox that is Corona is that capitalism as we know it will not change, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. I see the system staying the same, but the players changing. That's what I see happening. A new frontiers of capitalism, optimizing profits, yes. emerging. That's what I see happening. So capitalism as a concept or a system, I see it staying with us for some time. All classes of people have been affected one way or the other. But even when we've had cases of people being hit, there are those who will still gain. And that's how I see, you know, if you look at any system, any movement on one side affects the other one in another way. So COVID was touted as taking us all to a ground zero. But I sincerely don't see an even world because of COVID it will still be as competitive as we know it. Yes. Those intent, of make, intent on making money will still make money. But the one fundamental that will change, in my view, is that there'll be a greater appreciation for the greater good of humanity. Because what COVID has taught us is that you need the next guy to do your business. And if the next guy has no capacity or capability to trade with you, yes. then all you're doing is in vain. Such that would be my take. Very interesting. So, yeah, I think, John, this question could take 30 minutes to answer. <laughs> <laughs> or more. <laughs> you know, I, I like yourself. I think COVID is is creating a portal in, in through which capitalism has to step. What is beyond that portal, I cannot tell you 100%, because it could be very bifurcated. What do I mean by that? Firstly, if I look around the world, we've had all these statues being toppled, we've had uh, Black Lives Matter, we've had a level of uh, civil unrest which we haven't seen for a very long time. This is all the chart points are showing up. Yes. And I think, firstly, what has happened is, I would put it like this. Have the workers had an epiphany? 
Mm. Or are they still thinking in these uh, boogaloo type ways? Do they realize that they that it, that it is them who are taking the pain? Unemployment, 25% in the United States. Each person got $1,200. I know we'd appreciate that here, but each but the the amount of that uh, response by the Federal Reserve was the equivalent of $30,000 per person. Yeah. $1,200 went to the individual. Where did the rest go? Yeah. So I think there's also a wider question about capitalism, the risk reward, um, the fact that the Fed has printed all this money, that the British have printed all this money, that Europe has printed all this money. Is it sustainable? And I think it isn't. I think 208 was the first shot across the bows. Um, and I think now you're getting, uh, a, 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 you know, you, you, we've reached a tipping point moment, whether it tips tomorrow or six months time or 12 months time, I'm not sure. What happens once it tips uh, is going to be a very complicated thing as far as I can see. And it could go two ways. What I'm worried about more is what I would call the surveillance society. Mm. Today, in a way, you know, people are talking about uh, 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 these, these acts that are going to be given to us. How, the level of government surveillance over the citizen is frightening. To, you know, what, what, what people, I don't think, really appreciate the level that governments have gone in increasing, and whether it's Kenya, where today I saw that the cabinet secretary was talking about the ability to snoop on phone calls, but you've got a, essentially a Chinese surveillance model, which started out of Xinjiang, which is now spun through China, which is now actually has the potential uh, to go global, as far as I can see. And, open, and the final point I would like to make is about the economics is I think we're coming to a moment when we're going to have face quite a binary choice. I think, you know, whether it's Trump because of the election, um, he's going to try anything, but, you know, we're seeing increased uh, adversarial behavior amongst the Chinese and the U.S. Just generally, uh, you see that in the response that we've had uh, post-COVID. So I've got a lot of concerns about where we're going. It doesn't make economic sense to me in many ways. I, I think, you know, we've responded in a way we've responded here, you know, since 2008, we've thrown, the West has thrown more money at the problem and cheaper money at the problem. But fundamentally, isn't there an issue here that this economy cannot absorb this money anymore? There is a question as to how are our, our economies this size? How don't we have to recalibrate them and reshape them? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, on, on that, you know, it, it's it's a mixed note, but you know, I think rather bearish note. Um, <laughs> and clearly, what is going to you know what's going to transpire, uh, you know, as we come out of this portal is something that we we will need to come back to. So uh, as as we end, gentlemen, I I I'm I'm, I'm booking you again. Um, <laughs> we are, we're, we're, we're we're now at the end of June, uh, and I'd love to be able to come back to you uh, in about three weeks' time, because things yes. are moving fairly quickly, and and basically ask the same questions and 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 reflect uh, a bit more. But you know, I I you know. I'd like to say a very big thanks on behalf of the Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ali Kansach, Julian Roa, for your time Thank this you. afternoon. Thank and you. Uh, as I said, I'll be coming back to you so that you can keep us uh, educated and uh, with a picture of what's going to happen in the future. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.